I'm Lisa Usda, News 1130's legislative reporter, and we're continuing with our FaceTime conversations with the leaders. Up now, NDP leader John Horgan. John, thank you so much for joining us. Good to be here, Lisa. John Horgan, of course, different from the rest, trying to be re-elected, not elected anew. And we're going to start off with a question that you might say is a bit of do-over. We go to Omni's Bowen. If you re-elected, how will you deal with the systemic racism? How will you protect the Chinese community from racism? That's a very good question, and, and it's something that we shouldn't just be talking about during election debates or just talking about during election time. We need to talk about systemic racism every day in communities right around BC. And the good news is that people are talking around their kitchen table and saying, what can we do? What are our choices going forward? What we have done as a government is uh, the BC Liberals eliminated the Human Rights Commission. Uh, we reinstated it. And we're going to be working with the Human Rights Commissioner to bring forward anti-racism legislation that will help us understand and eliminate systemic racism where we see it. We've undertaken a review of the Police Act. It's some 45 years old. That's an all-party endeavor, so that the part, there's no partisanship when it comes to racism. It's just racism. And I believe all parties agree that we need to continue to do that work. Uh, we've also brought forward the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, which say quite clearly that Indigenous peoples have been here for millennia, rights and title exists in British Columbia, and now we need to move forward to make sure that true reconciliation happens. The challenges, of course, for the Chinese Canadian community, I believe, is telling the stories of how long Chinese Canadians have been here. And that's why we've established a Chinese Canadian museum, so that we can tell our stories, our cohesive uh, stories about inclusion over, over generations, and so that we have a better story to tell in the future. The consequences of systemic racism are felt every day. And I think when COVID hit, we saw examples on our television screens of people just wantonly pushing people of Asian descent to the ground. There needs to be consequences for uh, assault or, or, or hate crimes such as that. I'm committed to doing that, and I know my government is as well. And speaking of immigration, you know, Canada, BC, were built on people coming from other places. They can have challenges working in their career of choice when they get yep. here. And so as far as that goes, we have a question from Arvin with Omni. If elected, what can your government do to increase the participation of immigrants who are licensed professionals in their home countries? Yeah. That's a great question, and recognizing credentials has been a problem in British Columbia for a long, long time. Much of that work is done by the appropriate colleges or regulatory bodies, whether it's engineering, medicine, and so on. Uh, we want to make sure we're accelerating that, particularly on the health side. We have a crisis in health professionals. We need to ensure that people in our community, wherever their credentials were granted, are able to practice their trade or their, their uh, profession here in BC. This has been a commitment for the past three and a half years and we're making some progress, but we have a long way to go yet to address that. But I think people understand quite clearly that we need skilled workers to meet the challenges of the 21st century. We are a community that is filled with diverse, talented people. Those credentials need to be recognized as quickly as possible, and we're going to accelerate that activity. And I know that you have done work with the colleges, so what specifically, what tangibly can you do to urge the colleges to move faster? And because, of course, with long-term care, like there's a lot of places we need yep. people working in health care. What tangibly can be done to have that happen fast? Well, we're, we're uh, going to institute a new uh, medical training center, a new uh, medical school uh, south of the Fraser in Surrey. That will help us if, there, if there's one or two issues that require upgrading uh, within uh, a particular credential in the healthcare field, we'll have more spaces to do that. When it comes to things like engineering, for example, which again, uh, we have a whole bunch of people with architecture, engineering, and other uh, professional accreditations from other jurisdictions, we need to push those, those colleges to do it faster. If they won't, then we can move legislation to make that happen. And we're going to go back just for a second to systemic racism and a question from City News's Isabel. Many people voice their disappointment with the answers given Tuesday when it came to racism. One UBC expert said it's not enough that our government leaders uh, say that they are not racist, they need to be anti-racist. So we want to know what are some concrete ways that you and your government are going to be anti-racist? 
that's a very good question. And uh, what people want, uh, people of color want, is not empathy during a, a 30 second answer. They want action every day to eliminate systemic racism. And as I said, that's why we're looking at things like the Police Act, so that we can ensure that it's modernized and contemporary and looks at British Columbia for what we are today, not what there was 50 years ago when the legislation was first developed. Uh, we asked Mary Ellen Terpel LaFond, a, a tenacious fighter for human rights, the former child advocate here in BC, to look into allegations that, that in our emergency rooms across British Columbia, racism was existing when people of color came into emergency wards. Totally unacceptable. Action needs to be taken by governments, not 30-second uh, responses and sound bites, but genuine action. We've got anti-racism policies in place through the inclusion process that we put in under Ravi Kalon, who traveled around. Gathering uh, race-based data will allow us to do a better job of making sure health provision and the response to the pandemic are clear and transparent. I also am very, very, very popular with me, anyway, as a historian, is to tell the stories of our inclusion so that we understand that we have all been here together for a long, long time. And when we see racism. We need to stand up and speak against it. We need to make sure that there's, an, there's consequences for racist behavior. And that's why new anti-racism legislation is a high priority for us and is a key part of our platform. And looking at the per more personal level, talking about personal bias was one of the issues of the question that was asked during the debate. Yeah. On a personal level and with your cabinet and with your caucus, have you done anti-racist sensitivity training? Oh, of course we have. Uh, that's part and part, as well as uh, gender sen sensitivity. Uh, I'm very proud of the, the, the candidates that we have running in this election. 53% women, 25% uh, uh, black, indigenous, or people of color, uh, LGBTQ candidates, young candidates. A diverse group of candidates reflects the diversity of our communities. And the best way to stamp out systemic racism is to have the system reflect the community that we live in. Starts with our legislature. It has to percolate through our public service, uh, law enforcement, other frontline workers need to reflect back to the communities, the people that they're either serving or protecting. Uh, these are critically important issues. We've been focused on it as a political party for a long, long time. And I, the, the results are there for the candidates that we put forward today uh, for election. Diverse, dynamic and reflecting the modern British Columbia. Moving from racism to the issue that we just can't escape, the COVID pandemic, we have a question from Travis from City News. Many British Columbians are waiting with bated breath for a COVID vaccine. If and when a vaccine is developed, how will you ensure people in all corners of the province get quick access to it? Well, we're committed to ensuring that, that when the COVID vaccine arrives, it will be free to all British Columbians. And that's critically important. People need to know that we're all in this together and we're all going to get out of it together. There will be, of course, priorities put in place in, in places like long-term care facilities. The most vulnerable in our population will be the first to receive the vaccines, frontline workers and so on. So there will be a prioritization of the dist distribution of a vaccine, but it will be made mass available to the entire population province at no cost and that's how we hang together. We've had so much progress. What people want from their government now is not to focus on the next few months but the next few years and to make sure that everyone understands that the only way we come out of this with a, an economy and a public health system that works for everyone is if we focus on that and let's make sure that we address the most vulnerable first and then move from there. And we have the challenge here not just of the pandemic but also another crisis and for that we go to David with City News. BC's other pandemic is the opioid crisis. More than 5,000 people have died from an illicit drug overdose in this province since the public health emergency was declared in 2016. It's a problem hitting every corner of our society from people on the street to people dying in their own homes. And the monthly death toll numbers just came to see getting worse. What will your party do to bring the overdose crisis under control? Well, thank you very much for the question. And we did make some progress in 2017, 2018, and into 2019 by having a standalone minister responsible for mental health and addictions, the first in Canada. That allowed us to make sure that we were channeling health dollars into treatment beds, making sure we were bringing uh, forward uh, prescription alternatives to uh, dirty, poisonous street drugs. Dr. Henry, who was, of course, uh, presented to be the most outstanding public health officer in the country when it comes to COVID-19, 
expertise is also in uh, managing uh, the pandemic that we have with the opioid crisis. So to have someone of her capacity offering us science-based advice is very, very, very important to us. I called on the federal government to decriminalize simple possession. We already do that in British Columbia. In 2017, when we became government, we directed law enforcement to not pursue uh, simple possession because we would not prosecute. The separation between the attorney general and the solicitor general is such that we just made the case we're not going to prosecute. But it's important for the broader community to understand that the federal government is prepared to follow police chiefs across the country and other leaders within BC and, and elsewhere. Let's decriminalize, let's destigmatize addictions so that we can ensure that we're protecting everyone. And that's the first way forward is to make sure that the community understands that these are our brothers, our sisters, our neighbors, our co-workers that are afflicted by these addictions and they need our help and our compassion. That's what we need to focus on. And you mentioned, you know, that, that, that uh, the crisis was bad, but not as bad as when the pandemic hit. Now the pandemic has shown us how quickly, how flexible a government can be. Why are we not moving that quickly, that flexibly and that aggressively on the COVID crisis? You were there for three and a half years. Yeah, well, we have been, and the numbers were coming down. But what happened with COVID-19 is that physical distancing became the standard. People were finding themselves using uh, opioids by themselves rather than in uh, uh, harm reduction facilities or with other people. That led to more people being alone, and that's been the, the increase in deaths as a result of that. Also, uh, because our borders are closed, the importation of fentanyl and other drugs has been diminished. So that means that the drugs are becoming even more toxic as uh, those that are pushing and preying on the vulnerable uh, put more poisons in these drugs to get their bang for their dollar. Law enforcement's fundamental to our success here. That's the whole essence of a four pillar approach. You need to have harm reduction. You need to have treatment. You need to have enforcement. And you need to make sure that the compassion that we all need to bring to this issue is front and center every day as we destigmatize not just addictions but mental health issues as well. And you mentioned Dr. Bonnie Henry and it's no doubt your respect for her but one of the things she pushed for was the safe supply. Would we not have been in a less devastating position had that come in sooner had you not waited so long to, to act on that? Well, we have acted on it, and we're going to continue to aggressively push that. Uh, safe supply, prescription alternatives is foundational to Dr. Henry's recommendations to us, and we're moving on it. We've been doing that, and we'll continue to do it after the election, should we be uh, fortunate enough to form the next government. And moving on to housing and affordability and how we afford to live, which is a big challenge, we go to Rhea with News 1130. Well, Vancouver has long been an unaffordable place to live, and with the COVID-19 pandemic, quite a few young people are losing their jobs or seeing reduced hours in the workplace, especially if you're in tourism or hospitality. So if you were voted into power, what would you do to make sure that young people can stay in the city? Well, enormous challenges before COVID, uh, certainly much worse today. Uh, with respect to job loss, we put in place a $6 billion plan uh, supported by all of the members of the legislature to get those dollars between budgets, the most, um, the, the largest amount of money approved between budgets in BC history. And we're putting that into people, businesses and communities. The challenges are daunting, but on the housing front, we were the only province in the country that gave a break to renters during the pandemic. We increased uh, income assistance and disability pensions for uh, up to the end of this year, and we'll look uh, in the next budget process how we can continue to keep people that the most vulnerable and those with the least means uh, can keep them whole going forward. But housing prices in Vancouver went up $600,000 over two years between 2014 and 2020. 16, largely because of speculation, people not buying homes to live in, but as a commodity. We brought in a speculation and vacancy tax that taxes people who don't live here so that we can build houses for people who do. The BC Liberals want to do away with that. We believe it's good policy. And you know what? The vast majority, overwhelming majority of British Columbians do as well because they don't have two homes. Very few have any homes at all. We want to put in place breaks for renters. We've been doing that. We're going to have a, a renter's rebate as part of our election platform, as well as a $1,000 COVID bonus to British Columbians on middle and low incomes. So they've got dollars in their pocket to spend on their needs. Uh, eliminating the PST does not help you with your rent, does not help you with your childcare or your food or your children.
children's clothing because they're already PST exempt. Giving people cash in their pockets to make decisions for their families, I believe, is a better way forward. It doesn't put a big hole in the budget like the Liberal plan and allows us to create programs and grants for small businesses and workers in small businesses like tourism and some of the hospitality sectors and make sure they can get money into their pockets to get through the winter and we'll make better preparations for the spring uh, come the February budget. You know, some cynics say that with that $400 rental rebate, which was a promise last time, coming through this time in the thousand dollars, you're just trying to buy people's votes. Well, when the B.C. Liberals say they want to reduce uh, the marginal tax rate for wealthy people, that's trying to buy votes. Uh, I mean, giving a tax break to wealthy people does not help the vast majority of British Columbians. Giving them money to spend in their community, the vast majority of middle and low income families will take that $1,000 and buy goods and services that they need in their community, stimulating more economic activity. Uh, the rent or rebate was a program that we should have put in in 2017. The Green Party wouldn't support us. We're putting it up again, uh, and I'm hopeful that we'll be able to implement that because we give homeowner grants to those who are fortunate enough to own a home. Uh, to to some more in the tune of it for some uh, homes up to two thousand dollars annually so why wouldn't we help renters i mean if we're helping homeowners we should help renters as well i think it's a, a question of fairness i'm proud of the policy and i look forward to implementing it and now looking at how people get around metro vancouver and other places a question about infrastructure from sonia from news 1130. Many Metro Vancouverites have no choice but to commute every day. We don't have a replacement for the Massey Tunnel. The new Patello Bridge is still years away. And the idea of a third North Shore crossing seems like a dream. So what is your plan to give commuters more options and to be more proactive about infrastructure projects? Well, we have been uh, proactive on the, the Patella replacement. It's underway now. It will be completed in the next couple of years. But with respect to the Massey replacement, only one community supported the BC Liberal plan to build a massive bridge, and that was the community of Delta. We sat down with people in Richmond and other uh, municipalities around the Lower Mainland and came up with the plan to put another, a second tunnel under the under the Fraser River so that we could address that congestion point. It won't be told as the BC Liberals were going to do with their bridge. It will be there for people to use. It has the support of the federal government, so that'll reduce the cost uh, for British Columbians. And we want to get on to it as quickly as possible. There are some salmon issues that the Department of Fisheries and Oceans federally uh, are still looking at. There will be an environmental assessment, of course. And we need to do consultation with the Tawasan First Nations. But there is buy-in from every community. Let's get an immersed sub uh, a tunnel in the ground and in the water so that we can address that congestion point. With respect to public transit, we're underway. Uh, contracts have been let for the Broadway extension out to Arbutus and beyond. Uh, we're starting SkyTrain from uh, from St. George to. Uh, uh, King George, rather, uh, to Fleetwood. And we also announced through the pandemic another $9 billion in capital to build out British Columbia to take SkyTrain all the way to Langley. These are initiatives that are desperately needed. They could have been started sooner. Uh, we've had the past three and a half years to make progress. Patello was critically important. People don't understand. It was falling into the river. If you've used that bridge, it's among the most dangerous uh, in the Lower Mainland. It needed immediate attention. Uh, instead of focusing on the immediate challenges to our crumbling infrastructure, the Liberals proposed uh, five years, seven years ago now, a 10-lane bridge that nobody wanted. And now that's why we have a deficiency in, in, in transportation infrastructure. We're going to re revive that, get it done as quickly as we can. Just really quickly, the one to Langley, like how realistic is that's going to happen any time in the next five, 10 years? Really oh, it's quickly. very realistic. Okay. It's, fa it's, phase th it's phase three of the mayor's plan. We're accelerating that. Uh, we already have uh, resources in place to get to Fleetwood okay. uh, for phase two. And that and that phase three goes to UBC at the uh, Arbutus end and into Langley uh, at the uh, Fleetwood end. And we're committed to doing it. And there's now $9 billion in the capital budget to do that. Changing tack here, letting people get to know you a little bit more. We know that you're a Star Trek fan, but when you have a little bit of time, what do you watch on the TV? Uh, well, most, mostly, uh, um, mostly science fiction and fantasy. Yeah. That's that's kind of my thing. Uh, I do I do uh, I do like uh, Life in Pieces. Uh, I, I only watch bits at a time. I, it's on Netflix. I don't know if other people are watching that. I could I could binge that all day, but I, I I deliberately say to myself, there are not enough episodes. Just watch two at a time and then leave it for a week. But I, I love that. It's great acting. It's episodic television. Uh, that's my thing. I like to laugh I hate and the I like to get a word that doesn't out. exist. Hmm? I hate the shows you have to dole out. You have to just all yeah. hold back. Well, and exactly. It's just going to be gone. I will try life in pieces. And last question. 
in the uh, in the theme of wanting collaboration, and we know Sonia Firstino certainly has talked a lot about it. Can you say a kind thing, something you respect, something you like about each of your competitors? Absolutely. Uh, I've been working with Sonia for the past three and a half years. We've done a lot of great things for British Columbia, particularly uh, largely because of Dr. Weaver, I have to say, but we have the most progressive forward-looking climate action plan in North America, and I'm very proud of that, and that was a collaborative effort. Uh, Sonia represents an area that I used to represent because we're side by side on Vancouver Island, so I see her frequently, and her passion for, for Shawnigan Lake, where she lives and where I love to recreate, is, is unparalleled. She loves the natural environment, and, and I, I, I see it in her eyes when she talks about the special places in her community. With respect to Mr. We Mr. Wilkinson, that's a harder deal because he just yelled at me for an hour and a half today. But uh, I do know him to be a very intelligent, capable individual, and uh, his public service is, uh, he has a record of public service, and people can look that up. Thank you so much for your time, John. That's NDP leader John Horgan. He's looking for your vote. Election Day, October 24th. There's a multitude of ways you can cast your ballot. For all your information about campaigns and elections, go to citynews1130.com.